Okay, folks, uh, welcome, man. welcome back. If you have uh, there any questions before we start, because your quiz is day after tomorrow, I kind of sent you multiple emails on it, past quizzes. So hopefully you're getting ready or you, you're already ready. So uh, any questions on that before we start? So I'll give you the specific time at which the quiz is going to be accessible. It's going to start, as I said, the window is about nine to 10 hours. And um, I've been, originally I was going to end the window at 2 p.m. New York time, but I was told there are some of you with classes back to back to back to back and that you wouldn't be able to do it before two. So I'm going to extend it through 3 p.m., which would be through this class. That way you can't have an excuse of another class. It is this class. You might not be able to, because the class is still going to be on, you might not be able to do both the quiz and the exam at the same time. But at least if this is the only time you can take it, you can take it between 2 and 3 p.m. on Wednesday. So it'll be accessible at that time as well. Just make sure you start by 2, because you need at least an hour to do the quiz. Um, no questions on the quiz? OK. So today we're going to complete the process of estimating cash flows, at least last year's cash flows. So, and one of the things we'll have to wrestle with is every, every cash flow calculation starts with an earnings number. And if that earnings number is negative, you're already going to end up with negative cash flows. Not the end of the world. For some companies, that is actually what you should end up with. But for companies that have been around a while, when you get a negative number, it throws you off because you feel that this is not the right starting point. So let's make this specific. Let's assume you're looking at a cruise line company. You can pick any cruise line company that you want. And obviously they made, they lost money in 2020. It doesn't even matter which cruise line. So let's say it's Royal Caribbean. You're a money losing company. And one of the things you're taught to do when you have a money losing company is in fact, when people talk about normalizing earnings, it sounds like they're talking about fancy stuff. Here's what they do. They take the earnings in the five years prior they average it out and use it as normalized earnings. So Sergio, I'm gonna put you on the spot. So you're looking at Royal Caribbean, last year's earnings were a disaster. I replaced last year's earnings with an average of the last five years. What am I assuming that Royal Caribbean is gonna be able to do once COVID passes? <laughs> Return back to pre-COVID levels. Pre-COVID levels. And would you be comfortable with that assumption? No, not at all. Yeah. And most people would, right? And common sense, as you can see why, because a lot of people will never get on a cruise ship again. You would have to hold a gun to my head and have a cannon behind me and make me march up the ramp to get on a cruise ship after this. So clearly I can't do that. With, could I do that with an airline? Ariana Sanchez, what do you think? If you're looking at an airline, you're probably going to look at 2020 and see losses, even with Southwest or could I, do you think I could get a, with the cruise line, clearly it's not. With an I, airline, what do you think? I think the same with airlines. I think there will be an ultimate return of consumer confidence, but I think if I'm doing just next year, I don't think it'll be back to 100%. No, even in the, so let's say if we're talking even in the long term, is, is it just a question of confidence though? I mean, what part of the airline business is I think up in the air, even if confidence returns, what part might never return? Um, I know they've had to make cuts otherwise. So will there be the same return of um, the flights and will they be able to get back to even operating to previous um, return? And then also business travel as someone who doesn't know if I'll ever- okay, Now we're on to something. Do you know that half of the revenues for airlines come not from you and I flying on vacation, it comes from business travel. And it's one segment of business travel that subsidizes most of the aircraft, right? You know the section I'm talking about, the section you walk through to get to your seat when you're going on vacation, where people have these seats that look like they're designed for 500 pound people and they've taken and they're already got their champagne out. And those business seats look awfully good until I tell you it costs you eight thousand dollars to fly from New York to London. Who pays that? I mean, eight thousand dollars, that sounds absurd, right? But businesses pay it because, you know what might never come back? Is people are looking, why are we paying $50,000 to fly four people to London for a one hour meeting when you can do it on Zoom? Airlines, questionable. Cruise lines, definitely off, airlines, questionable. 
But what if you're a hotel company and you get primary? There you say, maybe. So see what I'm trying to say is, if you ask me, is it okay to normalize by taking the last five years of earnings? I couldn't answer the question until you tell me which company. Maybe if it's a company where I can assume that whatever caused the problem, the temper, and you're going to bounce back to pre-COVID levels. I'll be quite honest, I am not sure what COVID is going to do to almost every business. So this averaging process, which people have used routinely for much of the last 50 years to normalize earnings, maybe we need to rethink whether that's the right way to go. I'll give you alternatives, but basically this is something that's up for debate because the answers I would have given you two or five years ago might no longer apply. Here's another question. And today we're going to talk about cash flows to equity towards the end of the class. And remember, cash flows to equity are um, you know, cash flows after debt payments, after reinvest, after everything. Okay? So you're valuing equity in a company. You're projecting free cash flows to equity for the next five years. And you discount those free cash flows to equity back at the cost of equity to get the value of equity today. But let's say those free cash flows to equity are negative in year one, negative in year two, negative in year three. And if you're doing a company like Airbnb or Palantir or pretty much any young company, they're going to be negative all the way through. So in a DCF, you have negative, negative. You don't care. It's just discounting. Who cares? Present value function still works. But what are you assuming your company will be able to do in year one? When I say that free cash flow to equity in year one is minus a billion. And then I go to year two and year three and year four and year five. What am I assuming you're going to be able to do in year one for this DCF to work out? So here, what am I assuming your company is going to be able to do? Your, your... Yes. Um... A positive free cash flow equity is potential dividend, right? That's what they yep. can pay out. What is a negative free cash flow equity? So, uh, you need to take on more debt. To... No, no, actually you need to take on more equity. You need to raise fresh capital. It could be debt, but if it's free cash or equity, you're gonna have to. What am I assuming? I'm assuming capital markets will stay open and accessible for the next, you know, if you have three years of negative cash flows. And I'm making that assumption inclusive. When I see valuations of startups, I see this assumption all the time, negative, negative, negative. Oh, year five, it's positive. But you got to get to year five to see Nirvana, right? If you don't make it through year one, there is no year five. We implicitly assume that companies survive, that they have access to capital. Is that a safe assumption? In a market that's doing well, where there's a lot of risk capital flowing in, of course, it's a safe assumption. In 2000, 1999, 1998, before the dot-com bust, people made this up. What's the big deal? Dot-com company needing to raise a billion dollars. Then you got to 2001. And what do you find? Markets had shut down. We're going to talk about this assumption more in more detail as we go through, because for companies to be worth what they are, they have to survive. And for that survival to happen often, they need access to capital. And that access to capital, if it gets shut off, will end your valuation. The game is done. And we're going to think about how to bring that into value. Any questions on this? Because we're going to talk about, as I said, more detail as we go through. Um, I let's go. Go ahead. My quick question is, I understand that that's not a safe assumption to make. But if you didn't make that assumption, wouldn't no one ever invest in any startup? Is it, is it, a, is it a, Ali, the question is, is it zero or what? You, you, it's, right. it's not, a, so is there a way in which I can say there's an 80% chance mm -hmm. that this will happen? Because that's the more realistic way to think about it. It's not 100%, it's not a 0%, it's some number in the middle. And here's what's gonna drive it. It's gonna depend on what the market looks like. Is the market looking good? In which case, the likelihood that they will make it is much higher. It'll depend on how far along in terms of a business model the company is in, right? If it's more advanced, maybe you'll have more access to capital. So it will depend on the company, the market, the time you're looking at it, but let's, it, it doesn't have to be zero one. And that's exactly where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna say, look, rather than treat with there's a 100% chance you'll always make it or no chance you will not make it, maybe we not need to start to think more seriously about what percentage that is and actually explicit bring it into valuation. Thank you. 
So let's go back to where we were talking about capitalizing R and D. Yossi, what what's why why do we capitalize R and D? What what's the underlying rationale? What what is the so give me the rationale for why we capitalize R and D? Because they're a debt. Um, no, the leases are debt. R and D is not debt. It's a capital. Because they provide a cash flow in in the future. Sort of um... might be uncertain, but it's designed for future benefits. We're following accounting first principles better than accountants are for capitalizing R and D. And you can already see it's not just R and D. It could be you know exploration costs for an oil company. It could be recruiting and training expenses for a consulting company. It can be customer acquisition costs for a company like Grubhub, because they're all designed to create revenues in the future. So let's talk about the process by which we capitalize R&D because clearly this is going to be a problem we face in many companies, not just in pharmaceutical companies, but in technology companies and platform companies. So the process for capitalizing R&D is a straightforward one, but it's, it, 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 it comes with a lot of uncertainty. Something can be straightforward and uncertain at the same time. So let's say you are looking at a company like SAP. SAP is a software company, but it produces business software that requires a fair amount of R&D before that software is ready to be sold. First question I'm gonna ask them is, on average, how long does it take between the time you spend money on R&D and a commercial product emerges? The on average gives me some leeway, right? Because some R&D could pay off quickly, some might pay off in three, seven, nine. Let's assume that for a company like SAP, that's about five years. Now already you can see that if this were a pharmaceutical company, it'd probably be much longer, eight, nine, 10 years. If it were a consumer technology company, it might be three years. For a gaming company, it might be two years. For a perfume company, it might be one year, depending on you know, what kind of R&D you're talking about. But here, let's say it's five years. I go back and collect the R&D expenses every year for the last five years. So if you look at this, this table, there's your current year's R&D, 1.02 billion, and there are the R&D expenses for the last five years. You say, what are you gonna do with R&D from five years ago? I am going to stay consistent. I'm gonna argue that if R&D is a capital expense and it takes five years to pay off, the R&D from five years ago, I'd be writing off one fifth every year and the last one fifth is being written off. So 148.93 is just one fifth of 744.67 and the one fifth comes from the fact that it's a five year life. I write off the last chunk of my R&D from five years ago, there's nothing left over. The R&D from four years ago, I'm writing off one fifth, there's one fifth left over. R&D from three years ago, I'm writing off one fifth, there's two fifths left over. So basically with each expense, I'm looking at what I'm writing off this year, which is always one fifth and what's left over. If I add up the last column, I get 903 million. So basically I add up this last five, these five numbers. You're saying, what does that even mean? If I'd been capitalizing R&D all the way through, that would have been my amortization of R&D that would have shown up as an expense in this year's income statement. And if I'd been capitalizing R&D all the way through, if you add up the second to last column, my, what I get is 2.9 billion would be the capital that I've invested in R&D that I'm now going to show as an asset. And this is where accountants freak out. They say, but you're rewarding a company for something that might not pay off. No, bringing something onto the balance sheet is not rewarding a company. It's holding up to a higher standard because now this company has to deliver enough profits to justify the capital invested. Balance sheets don't value companies. They reflect what's invested in the project, the company. And I'm bringing the capital onto the books. So the 2.9 billion will show up as an asset, but remember balance sheets have to balance. So this time I'm gonna increase my equity because this R&D came out of after tax income, income to equity investors. So let's trace through. My amortization will now show up as an expense. My book value of assets is now gonna increase because I'm gonna bring R&D. My book value of equity will increase by the same amount. Here's the final adjustment. The original operating income you saw for SAP reflected the fact that R&D is an operating, well, they treat it as an operating expense. I'm saying that's not true, you shouldn't have done that. So here's what I'm gonna to do to adjust my operating income. I'm gonna add back the R&D expense from this year saying I should never have subtracted it out, 1.02 billion. 
And then I'm going to subtract out the amortization because that will be like depreciation this year, which means my operating income is going to increase by 117 million. So these are all in euros. You can see that my book equity changes, my operating income changes, my net income changes. I'm changing my perspective on the company. And I'm going to trace you to the other numbers. But before I do that, Naeem? Yeah, Professor, I just wanted a bit of clarity on the cash flow implications of uh, R&D. Can I hold off uh, on that? Because, for... Naeem, can I hold off on that? Because on the next table, I'm going to do exactly that. Because I can see exactly where you're going. And you say, why are we doing all of this? That's the implicit question. We'll talk about that. Uh, Ali? Is your hand up? From it was time? from last time. Okay. But honestly, Sorry. I would probably benefit from just one more explanation of this because I'm having a little trouble following. Okay. So you took the five-year life, right? So that's a, so let's suppose uh, you know, SAP says it takes about five years for R&D to pay off. So I start with that five years. I go back and collect the R&D expenses from each of the last five years. If I believe a five-year life, here's what I should be doing. I should be writing off one-fifth of the expense every year for five years, not just taking it as an expense in the year that I spent it. You with me so far? So I take the R&D expense from five years ago. I've been writing off one-fifth every year. My last installment gets written off this year. My R&D from four years ago, I'm writing off one-fifth. I so I keep track of two things, how much I'm writing off this year and how much is left over. What I'm writing off this year would show up as amortization on my income statement. What I'm not writing off will show up as an asset on my balance sheet because it's capital invested in r and And the income is adjusted because I'm saying R&D is not an operating expense, it's now a capital expense. So I add back cur the current year's R&D saying I shouldn't have subtracted it out but I subtract out the amortization of previous years. Are, so I'm treating it just as I would have physical land or building or equipment because this is what we do with traditional CapEx. We spread it out over time. Um, the one, I follow you until um, the 2.9 billion um, and the 903 million, where exactly are those? That's just the sum of the last, the last column is 903 million. So we add up those. The sum of this second last column is the 2.9 billion. The sum of the second the to numbers, Because that's so the that amount that I have written total value off. invested. Exactly. So basically yeah. it's a okay. sum of whatever's left over from previous years. Um, and the 117 million. Uh, that's how, because that'll be the change in my operating income this year when I, because right now I'm subtracting out the 1.02 billion. I'm saying I shouldn't do that. That's a mistake. So I'm adding that back the 1.02 billion, but subtracting out that 903 million, which is the amortization, because that would be an expense. So I'm just replacing what, what the accountants are doing, which is treating R&D as an expense with this, um, with this amortization number. Okay, thank you. Kushal? Just to clarify, on the 1.02 billion, we're saying yep. that, or I guess the assumption is that we've just spent that, that money. <laughs> it's right? not an assumption specific to you. When you say you're zero, when you take uh, the current year's numbers. You know what you assume when you do annual cash flows, right? Everything happens at the end of the year. That's basically, we do it for, for, for you can't selectively change that assumption here. So you're acting like the R&D expense from the last year has just been spent yesterday. And if it's just been spent, I don't get a chance to depreciate it. So you're gonna see this show up wherever we do things. And it's a reflection of the fact that we do this end of the year assumption when we do cash flows for convenience. And because we've done it for convenience everywhere else, we're kind of stuck with it here. We haven't had a chance to even touch it. It's just been invested. So let's work through how this will play out in the numbers, because um, I, I think this is a it's, a, it's a, it's a good thing to find the entire process worked out. So your SAP and you say, well, show me what will happen to my numbers. We capitalize R&D. Let's start with the operating income. Because I've capitalized R&D, that operating income is going to increase by 117 million. If you wonder where it comes from, that's a 117 million we calculated as a change. So my operating income will jump by 117 million. My higher operating income. Now, normally when you have operating income, you multiply by one minus the tax rate to get to the after-tax operating income. But here, there is a little bit of an advantage you get with the way things are done right now. It is actually good from a tax perspective for a company 
for R and D be treated as an operating expense. Do you see why? Because I get the entire tax benefit right away instead of having to spread it out over five years. Nothing I do in this particular analysis is changing the tax treatment. I'm still going to get the entire R and D expense as a tax saving, which means if I do this capitalization and act like the tax laws change as well, I'm overstating how much my company will pay in taxes. There's a tax benefit to the way R and D is expensed right now. Now. The, the, the bottom line is it's actually very easy to factor it in. The best way to factor in is just take your after-tax operating income and do this adjustment saying, look, you know, my taxes are my taxes based on tax law. This adjustment is something I'm doing in valuation to get a better sense of the company. So first step in the process is I have higher operating income. Second stop, I look at my balance sheet. What does capitalizing R&D do? It increases my book equity which increases my invested capital and anything else I compute using that book value number. It does nothing to my cost of capital because cost of capital is based on market value. Markets are not stupid. They factor an R&D into the market value. The cost of capital doesn't change. So my operating income has gone up by 117 million. My book value of equity has gone up and I start to produce my cash. And one of the items I need to get to cash flow is net capex. Before I capitalize R&D, it looked like SAP was investing nothing in CapEx because I took the CapEx and depreciation from the statement of cash flows. They were not buying land and buildings, so it's two million. But if I capitalize R&D, net CapEx instead of being two, billion, two million becomes 119 million. I've added the 117 million that I took out of operating income. Now, somebody earlier had the question about cash flows. Uh, Sahir, was the, uh, who is it that had the question about cash flows? It was me. Oh, Naeem. Was right. Naeem. So Naeem, Hi. let me put you on the spot. So basically your after-tax operating income increases by 117 million. Your net capex increases <laughs> by 117 million. Okay, I'm, I am just, um, I uploaded a bunch of PSCs like I randomly thought. I was like, let me just, I, I was doing them and I was like, I'm sorry guys, so ones. whoever it is so who's got the mic on, please turn it off because we can all hear you. Okay. okay. So your operating income, after tax operating income increases by 117 million. Your net capex increases by 117 million. Do you know what happens to your free cash flow before? Absolutely nothing. And that's intuitively makes should make sense. No matter what I do for R&D, remember you've spent the money, you've written the check. Say, so why are you doing all of this if your free cash flow to the firm, which is the number we're supposed to be discounting is not changing? It's not fair because I'm the one doing it name. So why do you think I'm going through this torture if my free cash flow to the firm is going to stay the same? I believe the ROIC changes for the firm, uh, but, uh, overall, because even though my earnings are increasing, my invested capital, because of the capitalization of the R&D also increases. Okay, so, so there is value in that. Okay, so, so that's one. What else changes? What reinvestment rate? How much a company? See, before I capitalize R and D, if you if you ask me to look at uh, SAP, my conclusion is, hey, this company is not investing for growth. So when I estimate growth for them, I'm going to give them a low growth rate. They're investing nothing. But once I capitalize R and D, I realize that they're investing a lot more than I thought they were, which changes my perspective on the company. Hey, this is all about the future, right? To estimate growth for the future, you need to estimate how much your company is reinvesting and how well it's reinvested, which is just a fancy way of saying, I need to get a reinvestment rate return on capital that actually, I have never understood how people value technology companies without capitalizing R&D. Because without capitalizing R&D, you have no idea what the company's putting, but it can make itself look much more profitable, right? All they need to do is cut their R&D to zero and you're going to give them a benefit saying your earnings went up. This is my recipe to make sure that when a technology company increases earnings the wrong way, by doing what? By cutting out the future, I can capture that because I've treated R&D as what it is, which is a true capital expenditure. So your initial point was, was a very good one. This is not going to change the free cash flow to the firm, but it's going to move numbers from the income to the net capex, and that is still a very useful exercise. Any questions on capitalizing? So you can see that if I gave you a platform company, Stephanie, you want to be my guinea pig on this one? I have a 
platform company, let's say it's uh, Grubhub. And Grubhub tells you that half of their SGNA is for customer acquisition. And they say, can we capitalize it? So be my advisor, can I capitalize it? And if so, what are the questions I need to answer before I can capitalize it? Because every platform company claims that most of the expenses are customer acquisition costs, right? This is a big sales pitch that they make. So what are the questions you would ask me in terms of deciding whether I can do it? How long do the customers stay on the platform? Exactly, you asked the question that I wish every analyst asked a platform company. Do you see why that matters? If you give me a Grubhub, let's say the way this works is you send me a $20 free Gub thing to try Grubhub and I try it. You've acquired a customer, right? But if three months from now I'm gone, you know what that expense is, it's just another operating expense. You just gave away money to get customers this year. If a customer stays on for five years or three years, now we're talking, now you can say, okay, your typical customer stays on three years, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your customer acquisition costs and did what I did with R&D, spread it out over three years. And this is where I think platform companies are being incredibly either sloppy or cynical. They all talk about customer acquisition costs, but you know how many of them actually report how long a customer stays on? Almost none of them do. In fact, for Netflix, one of the things you want is a renewal rate for subscriptions, right? Because that tells you how long. You know, you know how much you have to dig to get that number? They want the good stuff that comes from this pitch of, hey, we're buying customers, but they don't want to deal with providing with the data to make that assessment. So that's R&D. Let's move on to one time or extraordinary charges. If you open up your, and this is almost guaranteed that in with COVID hitting last year, you're gonna see companies doing all kinds of things. We have one-time charges, restructuring charges. If you have a company that has a truly one-time charge, and you're gonna see what I mean by truly one-time charge, let's see how we deal with it. Let's suppose you have a company that's reporting a half a billion dollar loss for last year, but as a one-time charge of a billion dollars. If you're valuing this company, what should you do with that one-time charge if it's a truly one-time charge? Brian, what do you think I should do if it's a truly extraordinary one-time charge? That's a profit of 500 million. Yeah, report a profit. It's truly one time, it's done, right? It's in the past, who cares? But every company claims to have these extraordinary one-time charges. Is there a way we could check to see if they're lying? What, what would you check, Brian? What, what, what might I want to check before I give them this credit? Well, their historical statements would have similar things on them. In every five years, you see a one-time charge of a billion. It's really not a one-time charge. It's a once every five-year charge, in which case the logical thing to do is, okay, what you're doing is taking $200 million in expenses each year, lumping them up and calling them a one-time charge. So the second question is, if you show one loss like this every five years, I'm gonna act like you're losing 200 million every year. And rather than give you an entire billion dollar add back, I'm gonna add back only 800 million. You see what I'm, why I'm adding back only 800 million? Because you know, 200 million of this would have happened anyway. This is the advantage of having that financial history. So when you download the numbers on Capital IQ, it's not because you're using the numbers for the last 20 years, you're looking for things in the financials that'll set up red flag where you say, you know what? That's really not a one-time charge. Starting in the 1990s, companies have become very good at what's called earnings management, which is just a nice way of saying they're playing the crap out of earnings. They do things like adding things, subtracting things. They move things from operating to one-time charges. It's almost like you've got to be a detective to figure out what's going on. But don't just take last year's numbers and just because a company calls this extraordinary, just say, okay, it's extraordinary. We're just gonna add it back. Check your priors to make sure it's truly extraordinary. And here's something I would never wish on you or my worst enemies. I pray and hope that the company you pick is not gonna report accounting fraud a month into this project. Because to be quite honest, there's not much you can do about it. In fact, 
you know, there's, it, it, we know in the last 25 years, there have been cases of accounting fraud. People actually, this is not just, you know, using the rules and fudging them. This is breaking the rules. And um, in some, some markets, you know, this is more the rule than the exception. Companies commit accounting fraud. So you know, what do I do about it? It's an area in accounting called forensic accounting. A forensic accounting is an incredibly boring. It's think of a mortician in valuation. Forensic accounting is what I call what morticians would do with valuation. They take apart every small piece. They look at every small piece of evidence. Somebody's got to do it. Forensic accounting is looking for clues in financial statements to see if you're a company that is potentially committing fraud. I'll give you a very simple and fairly effective test. You know, in the income statement, you get a measure of earnings, right? That's called accrual income because it's based on accrual accounting rules. If you go to the statement of cash flows, in the first part of the statement of cash flows, you take the net income and then you adjust add back depreciation, then you subtract out working capital change, you get what's called a cash net income. So you got accrual net income and cash net income. For any company, the two numbers will never match up because it will be different. But for a healthy company, in some years, the accrual income will be higher than the cash income. In other years, the cash income will be higher than the accrual income because things move back and forth. Let's say in your company, you look at your accrual income for the last 10 years, and then you look at your cash income for the last 10 years. And your cash income is consistently lower than your accrual income. Doesn't mean the company is committing fraud, but that's a big red flag. Something that the company is doing is allowing them to report higher net income. So they might be selling things for credit towards the end of every year and basically showing it as revenues and income, but you'll have big receivables, which push down your cash flows. That's what forensic accounting is. It basically goes through income statements and balance sheets, looking for these clues and saying, if you see these three red flags, then maybe you need to start to ask questions. I wish I could give you something more concrete than that, but it's, it's, you know, it's very difficult to think of a list that is going to work with every company, but that's what forensic accounting tries to do. Now, one of the things uh, I've asked every, every group to do is have at least one person with a money losing company. And this year, you know what? Your problem is finding a money making company, not a money losing company, because everybody seems to be losing money. So I'm gonna give you at least a template for what to do with a money losing company. Let's keep this simple. Why do money losing companies bother you? Because there's a minus in front of your earnings, right? I mean, let's face it, it's so much more it's so much easier when you have a positive earnings because you can do neat stuff like grow the earnings, improve, improve. But if you have a negative, it kind of throws you off. You have a money losing company. Now, what do you do about that loss will depend on why your company is losing money. Don't look at me like that. I know it's losing money because it's expenses exceed its, its revenues. But think of why companies lose money. Let me go through a series of potential reasons a company could be losing money. It could be something temporary. I'll give you an example. Many manufacturing companies with unions renegotiate their union contracts every five years or 10 years. So Boeing, this used to be a standard practice. Every time a union contract came up for renegotiation, there would be a strike. It's every 10 years, I think, a strike. The strike would last two to three months. In the case of Boeing, this is almost catastrophic. If you've ever driven by the Boeing plants in, in Seattle, this is like, my, I mean, you have a huge plant, you shut them down. It costs an immense amount of money to get them back in operations. So in those years, Boeing would lose money. But you know that once you get through this, you have another 10 years of okay things, and then you'll have a loss again. That is a truly temporary problem. Once the strike is over, you're going to bounce back. The second scenario is you're a cyclical company. You're a pretty healthy cyclical company, but the economy has gone into a recession. You know what? You probably lose money, not because you're a bad company, but because you... if you have temporary problems or just pure cyclicality, then there's an easy way out. You smooth things out. You say, look, you know, let me look at what the earnings would have been before that strike you know, without that loss from the strike, or let me look at what the earnings would have been in a normal economic year, not a recession year. And you can use that as your base year earnings and act like your company is back to normal. It's a dangerous assumption, you're assuming you'll bounce back to normalcy pretty quickly. 
Not sure that'll work in 2021 when COVID's the reason, but in a typical healthy economy, those are scenarios we can just normalize earnings and move on. But your problems could be deeper. It could be that it's related to the life cycle. You're losing money, not because you know, something bad happened to you, but because you're meant to lose money. You're a young company, you're building up business, your business model is still kind of evolving. Of course, you're gonna lose money. This is not something that's going to go away next year. Airbnb is not gonna make money next year. I know Elon Musk keeps saying they're making money. Tesla will not make real money next year. They'll make some fake earnings and they report it's positive. Why? Not because it's a bad company, but it's a young company building up to a really big market. It could be that you have more debt than you should have. And it's going to take you a while to bring your debt down. Of course, you're going to lose money. But your operations could be healthy, but the debt has to come down. Or worst of all, you have a structural problem. Like what? Like Carnival Cruise Lines has. What's their structural problem? They've got a business model where their basic business has been devastated by a virus that's changed the way people think about their business. You see what these three groups share in common? Here, the problems are not gonna go away next year. I can't assume a reversal back to healthy margins for a cruise line or for a young company next year because it's not gonna happen next year. You know what I have to do for these companies? I have to pick a target. In five years, and this is the storytelling, right? In five years, Airbnb will be a nice, healthy company. And this is what the margin will look like. And then I've got to kind of slowly move my company from where it is today to where the margin is going to be. So right now I could be at minus 10% margin, but if I think they can make 15% in five years, I'll go minus 10, minus five, zero, five. Basically I can get to 15 over five years. And as my margins improve, my losses will become profits. This freaks people out. They say, you're playing God. No, this is my job in valuation is to make those judgments. So if a money losing company, dig a little deeper, look at why your company is losing money and say, well, how do I get from where I am today to where I'd like the company to be? So for some of your companies, in fact, for many of your money losing companies, this is going to be a challenge, right? For some of your companies, you can say they're going to bounce back quickly. It was just COVID, COVID's over, we're all going to go back. You might just say, I'm going to normalize earnings. But for many of your companies, you will have to craft a pathway back to what you think their steady state is. And that margin in steady state might be very different than what it used to be five years ago, 10 years ago, because the underlying world is shifting. So any questions on, on earnings? Because all of the talk so far is that just getting the earnings number. Right? Uh, because now I want, yeah, go ahead. So um, what if the company is not making money in the next five years too? Like, can we go beyond five years on that? Like how- If you're investing how in the company, you're hoping to go beyond five years. I, assuming they survive, that's it. And this goes back to the earlier question. Losing money is not an issue if you see a pathway to making money. And you know what would trouble me is that the company itself doesn't seem to think there's a pathway. Now I've asked CEOs, how do you expect to make money? So I just wait and we'll make money. That's not a pathway. Tell me what you do. So you, if you think there's a pathway to making money, would, I, would you invest in a company that's losing money for the next five years? You have to have a lot of faith that that pathway exists. And you have to have faith that the company would survive. Okay? So would I invest in a company that I expect lose money for the next five years if I thought there was a big, huge, but let's say it's an artificial intelligence company. I can almost guarantee you no AI company is going to make money for the next five years. But I would invest in AI companies because I think it's a huge potential market. I'd have to find the company where I think that pathway is most plausible. But I can live with losses. Julie? Um, so I have a question if this is occurring like on a micro level as opposed to mm -hmm. macro. Um, let's say you have a company that was doing great and then a um, competitor comes in that steals a lot of their business. Um, steals is such a bad oh, word. Right? <laughs> takes a lot of their business. You're allowed yeah. to take somebody else's business. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so how do you predict whether the um, company is supposed to make a comeback or do you just look for them to change your business let's, model? Let, let's make this specific. Now, let's say you're Marriott. Who's been eating your lunch for the last five years? Airbnb has been taking away market from you. Are they going to come back? I don't think so. 
Why? Because this is something that, she, I mean, and I think that, that that's what it depends on, right? Sometimes competition comes in and you say, I'm never coming back from that. That's the essence of disruption. So you're adding a taxi cab company, Uber's eating your lunch. Your market share is gone. It's not coming back. Sometimes sto stories can be horror stories. So when you've added the companies, and essentially I see you getting smaller. And, and this has actually been the challenge with valuing brick and mortar retail companies for the last 20 years, right? Amazon's been taking market share away. There is zero chance that this company can take claw that market share back. It's different if you got blindsided by competition, you lost market share, but you think you can make it back because if you fix this, this, and this, you can come back. So I think that it will depend on the company, it will depend on the competition, it will depend on the business. You know? uh, but I think that that's one reason why we bring that story aspect into the valuation. Okay. So now let's move to the second. So we got EBIT, right? Let's move to the T, that EBIT times one minus C. Let's talk about the tax rate that you use to adjust your operating income. And I'll give you the choices of tax rates. And I want you to tell me which of these is the right tax rate to use. I could use the effective tax rate. You know what the effective tax rate is? It's basically an average tax rate that you pay. Take your tax. Uh, the way it's calculated is you take your taxes in your income statement divided by the taxable income in your income statement. So it's accrual taxes divided by accrual taxable income. That's an effective tax rate. You can use the tax rate, you compute yourself by taking the taxes and dividing by operating income, because after all this tax rate is gonna be applied on operating income. You could use the marginal tax rate of the country in which you operate in. So if you're a US company, you, use, you, know, you know the marginal tax, the tax rate in your last dollar of income. So you look at the US tax code, so what's the corporate tax rate? Maybe if you're a multinational, you could use a weighted average of your marginal tax rates across the countries you operate in. Maybe your answer is none of the above, in which case you better be willing to give me some other measure of tax rate because none of the above doesn't quite fit into an Excel spreadsheet. Oh, this would be great if it were true. Maybe you can use any tax rate you want as long as you use that same tax rate all the way through. You know why F is never going to be the right answer? Because if F were the right answer, all you have to do is, is be consistent. And you, what's the easiest tax rate to work with in valuation? Just use zero, right? If all you had to do is consistent, we'd never use taxes. So clearly F is not the answer. The question is A, B, C, or D. Anybody want to jump in or? Kyle Yang? Yeah. What do you think, what tax sure. rate do you think I should use? I'll go with D. D, which would be the weighted average marginal tax rate. Let's get some, uh, some perspective here. First, when I take a company, let's say Apple or Google, and I look at the effective tax rate, the marginal tax rate, which number will usually be the higher number, the effective or the marginal? Uh, marginal. Marginal, usually higher. And why is the effective tax rate usually lower than the marginal tax rate for US companies? Uh, that's actually the actual tax one, one is it could be working, in, it gets revenues from other countries, right? In which case your solution is a good one. Maybe you're a US company that gets 50% of your revenues in Hong Kong and you pay a 15% tax rate there and a 25%, in which case what you see as an effective tax rate just reflects the fact that it, in which case your solution works, take the weighted average marginal tax rate. What else could it explain? That's actually not the biggest reason, right? There are other reasons why the effective tax rate is lower than the marginal tax rate for companies. D, do you, who, what, what, what do you think are the other reasons that cause uh, the effective tax deduction? Sorry, Paul. Well, it has to be, can't just be tax deductions because remember the taxable income is already after your standard tax deductions. It's got to be some kind of other tax game you're playing. And well, deferring oh, taxes. Oh, the service is it? That's debt service is, is, is a debt, that's interest expense. So that basically will be taxable income is already after interest expense. So it can't be debt service because it's already factored in, right? So it's got right. to be I something that. that you're doing to defer taxes. Let's face it, companies do have tax lawyers who do a job of trying to push taxes out. So it could be that you're operating in many countries. It could be because you have deferred taxes. 
So I've kind of given you a clue. Let's de I'm going to come back to you. Let's say my effective tax rate for Apple is 15% and my marginal tax rate in the US is 24% or 25%. If I use the, and let's say the prime reason is because Apple is deferring taxes. If I use 15% as my tax rate all the way through my calculation. In other words, I keep the tax rate at 15%. What am I assuming about tax deferral at Apple going through time? What am I assuming that Apple can do? I'm assuming the company will be able to manage its effective tax rate at this lower level. In other words, that they can defer taxes forever. And if you believe that there's a padded cell in a federal penitentiary waiting for you, because you can defer taxes, but the word defer means eventually it catches up with you. You know when it starts to catch up with you is when your growth starts to level off. You know that as companies get more mature, the growth starts to level off, the effective tax rate starts to migrate towards the marginal tax rate. So I kind of answer the question there, right? You don't want to use the effective tax rate all the way through because you're going to understate taxes. You don't want to jump to the marginal tax rate right away because then you're not giving the company the benefit of the fact that it can defer taxes at least in the near term. So can I split the difference there where I can use both the effective and the marginal? D, I'm going to come back to you since you've got me this far. Yeah. So what could you do to, to use both? Um, I think we could start with the effective tax rate. There you go. And then and the, the terminal would be the marginal tax rate. Exactly, right? This way, you pay, you get the benefits of tax deferral while you can pull it off. And then as the company gets larger and its growth rate decreases, you push the effective tax rate to the marginal tax rate. As we go through, if you've been working with the valuation of the week spreadsheets, it, it seemed a little unfair that I sent you this black box and you know you look at the input say, why is he asking me for that number? Hopefully, as you go back and look at these spreadsheets, you'll see why I ask you for the number because one of the things I ask you in the tech in the spreadsheet is what's the tax rate today? And then I ask you, what will the tax rate be in your 10? Because if you want to kind of change the tax rate, I want to give you that leeway. So I think if you have to pick one tax rate and you're stuck with it, stay with the marginal tax rate, it's safer. It's effective tax rate can, can lead you to overvalue companies. But if you can use both, I don't see why not. Why not use the effective tax rate to get started and move towards your marginal tax rate? You know why you should never use the tax rate you get by dividing taxes by operating income? Because that tax rate will be low for companies which have a lot of interest expenses because the interest expenses reduce your taxable income. But that tax benefit is already in your cost of capital. You don't want to count in your cash flows. So I want to start, pause and make sure that you, so my, my suggestion is start with the effective tax rate, move to the end. If you have a company where you see a strange looking effective tax rate, you know effective tax rates can be negative because it could be years where you pay taxes, but what you report as taxable income is a loss, but that's because you have cash taxes coming due for other things. You have negative effective tax rates, just put in zero. It makes absolutely no sense to act like the government is going to keep subsidizing you as you go back to health. No. But the key is keep the marginal tax rate as your end game. And the marginal tax rate will not be in your company's financials. It will be in the tax code. And if you go to my website, I actually have marginal tax rates for every country in the world. I would love to say I did the research, but KPMG did it. I stole it from them. And they don't seem to mind that I reproduce it. So if you go click on tax rates by country, you can see what the tax rates look like. Okay. Any questions? Professor, could yes. I ask a quick um, special condition question on the tax rate? Mm -hmm. So I'm valuing a REIT and a REIT- REITs don't pay taxes. So there's no corporate tax. So basically you have a zero tax rate. Okay, but the, level. the effective tax rate like is like one or two percent. Do we yeah, start it's with usually that? because the accountants because there are transactions there you do pay some. It's got nothing to do with the income, right? The taxes based on transaction they have to show them somewhere, but the tax rate that you use for the cost of debt would be a zero tax rate. Okay, and your your earnings will be your you know after tax and pre tax earnings will be the same. Okay, thank you. You think that's a good thing the IRS is doing? Hey, the IRS does nothing without having a catch, right? So REITs are able to 
you know, not pay taxes, but how does the IRS make sure that somebody pays taxes? What are REITs required to do in terms of dividends? Pay out almost all of their earnings and dividends. You know what, the, the tax guy will get you one way or the other. This way, when the dividends get paid, they'll tax the guy who gets the dividends. So don't worry, don't feel you know, too much sympathy for, you know, for the IRS in this one. They, you know, they, they'll find a way to tax you anyway. So let's keep on taxes because there is this one aspect of taxes that can make it, it's not tricky, it's just tedious. When you lose money in a year, you don't, get, you don't have to pay taxes that year, obviously. But you do get a benefit, right? You take that loss and you can carry it forward. The old rule used to be seven years forward or three years back. You can actually take it back. Now, actually, I think you can take it forward for as long as you survive. You think, so what? Let's assume you're looking at a company, which is a, this is called an NOL, a net operating loss carry forward. You will see it, it should be reported somewhere in the annual report if you have it. But if you have a money losing company, I promise you there is an NOL. So let's say you have a company with a billion dollars in NOLs carrying forward. You expect this company to start making money next year, half a billion next year, half a billion two years from now, half a billion three years from now. You have to compute taxes each year. Help me out here. And Dave Rublin, you're going to help me out here. So in year one, how much would this company have to pay in taxes? Be 200 million. Will it though? It has an NOL. What are you allowed to do when you have an NOL? I guess you'd apply that. You can so. use it offset. So basically in year one, they're going to say no taxes because they've used the half a billion. Then you get to year two, you still have a half a billion left over from the NOL. Remember you used, so in year one and two, you will pay no taxes. And of course, uh, see, you know, somebody, some journalist will get a hold of your financial statements and show that you made a lot of money, you paid no taxes, that you should be designated to some kind of corporate health or no. But the reality is you're not paying taxes because you've accumulated losses from previous years. In year three, the NOL is done. You pay 200 million. So in year three, you will have a 40% tax rate, but years one and two, you'll have a 0% tax rate. So when you're valuing a money losing company, do you see the tedious additional step you have to carry? You have to look at not just the losses, you have to accumulate those losses over time and then once you start making money, you can use the, that accumulated loss to protect yourself from taxes until you run out of the NOL. It's not a big deal, but that's why you'll see an NOL line item in my, in my financials is to keep track of what that operating loss is so I can give you the benefit of less in taxes. So any questions about dealing with losses? So would you then project out your expected losses over the coming years yeah. and then use those as future shields? Exactly. Yeah. Right. It's, so in this case, if I had another half a billion dollar loss in year one, my annual would have become a one and a half billion at the end of year one. And then I'd use the one and a half billion. So when you have a company like Airbnb, which has never made money, the first thing to check is how much they're bringing into the game as NOLs. And then each year as they lose money to build up that NOL and when they start to make money, use that accumulated NOL. And that also is built into the spreadsheet. So if you look, one of the questions I ask is what is your NOL? And so why do you need to know it's for this reason to compute your future taxes? So let's talk about reinvestment. If you are used to financial models, the way this shows up is what's called net capex. Net capex is the difference between capital expenditures and depreciation. And I'll tell you why we net it up. Depreciation lowers your operating income, right? Because it's an expense, but depreciation is not a cash expense. Nobody writes a check out to depreciation. So that, even though it's an expense, that cash is still in the bank. You use the depreciation to cover some or a big chunk of your capex. So net capex is what you're using to increase the amount you've invested in your long-term assets. So let's start with the intuition. If you're a high growth firm, you expect to grow in the future, I would expect to see high net capex. Why? Because you can't get that growth without adding to your capacity. If you're a low growth firm, that net capex can become lower. And if you're a zero growth firm, I can assume that capex and depreciation offset each other and net capex can be zero. But to do this right, we have to define capex and depreciation correctly. Now do you see why we went through that elaborate dance with R&D? 
Because if I trust the accountants, these numbers don't reflect reality, right? Because the, the, what accountants call CapEx is what you invest in land, building equipment, machinery. Not R&D, not customer acquisition costs. So this goes back to the earlier point that I made, which was the reason we capitalize R&D is to get a better sense of what is this company reinvesting. So I'm going to include research and development costs with the capitalization. You know what else I'm going to include? If you're a company in a hurry to grow, you don't want to build your own factories. You don't want to design your own plants. You don't want to do your own R&D. You know what you can do? You can go acquire another company. I've never understood why we treat acquisitions as a special line item. It's just gigantic capex. And if you're a company that grows through acquisitions, I'm going to count what you spend on, on acquisitions as part of your capex. You know what that's going to do to your cash flows, right? It's going to make them more negative. You think that's terrible. No, not really. Then I'm going to give you the credit of the growth that comes from the acquisitions. And if that growth is high enough, you could still become a more valuable company. But acquisitions to me are part of net capex and acquisitions are tricky. And here's why. If I asked you how much did your company spend on acquisitions last year, which financial statement are you going to run to first to make to, to, to see if they did that? Now, where would you get the clues as to that? Hakan? I'm sorry. Which financial statement would tell me how much you spent on acquisitions? Uh, not, not sure, actually. If you spent money, if it's a cash acquisition, then the statement of cash flows, it should show up because you spend money, it, it, it has to show up. But if it's a stock based acquisition, God help you because it'll be in the footnotes somewhere. Maybe clues will be in the balance sheet. It's horrendously difficult. It's one of the things I mean, as accounting keeps adding these new disclosure requirements. One of the things that I push for is get rid of this crap that you make companies disclose. I would like a table of every acquisition you did during this year, whether you paid for it with cash or stock, how much you paid for it, so that I can see how much you spent on acquisitions. You know what the, what the argument companies use against counting stock-based acquisitions? They say, but it's not a cash flow. Really? Use the barter system to evade cash flows? If I taken the shares, issued them in the market, taken the cash and done the acquisition, so basically you skipped a step, right? It's the same argument I use against, you know, not counting stock. I mean, people say stock compensation is not a cash flow. Not true. You just skipped a step. And they say, how big can these acquisitions be? Well, it depends on the company. In the 1990s, company that actually caught everybody's attention, growing out of nothing to this huge $400 billion market cap was Cisco. And Cisco was a unique company in terms of how it grew. It did very little internal R&D, but it went out and did 10, 12, 15, even 20 acquisitions every year of small technology companies. And it built up this you know, massive company. There was a brief time at the end of nine, the middle of 99 where Cisco was the largest market cap company in the world. Very brief, but it, so if you looked in 1999 at the peak of Cisco's glory, here's what they did during the course of the year as acquisitions, just one year. They spent $2.5 billion in acquisitions, three of which they paid cash for, and the remaining six for which they use shares. You think, what is pooling and purchase? Accounting in this strange way of accounting for acquisitions. Thank God this is in our past. But if you use stock, you could use what was called purchase accounting, which meant you could evade the requirements of showing goodwill. But Cisco spent $2.5 billion in acquisitions. So in 1999, I wanted to estimate what Cisco's cash flows looked like. And here's what the net capex for Cisco looked like based on my view of Cisco. I start with what the accountant gave me. I went to the statement of cash flows to Cisco and the capex at Cisco was 584 million. The depreciation was 486. If I stopped right there and I trusted the accountants, it looks like Cisco is reinvesting about 98 million during the year. But that's a complete lie. 
Because during that same year, if you amortized R&D, that added another 1.1 billion. So I did exactly what I did with SAP, I did with Cisco, that adds another 1.1 billion to the net capex. And if I bring in the acquisitions, my net capex just in 1999, one year, was $3.7 billion. Now, is that good? Is that bad? Well, it's only half the equation. They're reinvesting a lot in 1999. What's the question I haven't answered? Are they reinvesting? Well, we'll come back and look at this. In 1999, they were pulling off this amazing trick of reinvesting a lot and reinvesting well at the same time. But this is why we capitalize expenses like R&Ds to get a better sense of what that reinvestment looks like. So if you have a company that grows through acquisitions, do the right thing, go out and look at how many, and it'll jump around, that's the problem with acquisition. Some years you can do them, some years you might not. Look at averages across time, look at statements of cash flows across time. When I valued Airbnb, that's the thing that jumped out at me. Airbnb has been acquiring about 10 to 12 companies every year for the last 12 years. Usually it's small companies that bring in a technology that their platform needs. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but when I did their valuation, this was their reinvestment. It didn't take the form of R&D. It wasn't customer acquisition costs. It was basically acquisitions of companies. And I have to treat that just as I would any other CapEx. Any questions on net CapEx? Let's talk about working capital. You know, the accounting definition of working capital is that current assets minus current libraries. That's not the definition we're going to go with here. Again, the accountant says that's working capital, but the working capital we use in valuation is the difference between non-cash current assets and non-debt current liabilities. Let me back up. You look at the current assets of a company, you'll see inventory, you'll see accounts receivable, and you will see cash and marketable securities as current assets. I'm not gonna count that and here's why. You know why inventory drains your cash flows? If you increase inventory, that's cash tied up, right? Basically that inventory is tying up cash. When you sell items on credit and you don't charge interest, that again is tying up cash flow. So inventory and receivables, when they go up, tie up cash. They're wasting assets. Cash is not a wasting asset. In what sense? When you look at a company like Google with 100 billion in cash, that it's not sitting in currency around, it's being invested, earning a low rate of return, but a fair rate of return. Cash is not a wasting asset, so I take it out of current assets. Let's go to the current liabilities. If you look at a balance sheet, look at current liabilities, you'd see accounts payable, supply credit, deferred taxes, deferred this, deferred that. But you'll also see short-term debt and short-term portion of long-term debt, right? I'm taking those out of the current liabilities. I'm gonna put them in with debt and treat them like debt in my cost of capital. So I can't count that as debt in cost of capital and in working capital. So non-cash current assets minus non-debt current liabilities. And that number is the most volatile item on the balance sheet. What I mean by that, it'll go up some years, drop. So if you look at any particular year, working capital might be a cash inflow or a cash outflow. It could go up or down. And if that's the case, the most sensible thing to do is to think about you know, what it will be in the long term. So a couple of things on working capital. And I told you at the start of this class, in 40 years of valuation, I've never once broken working capital down into its constituent parts. You know what I'm talking about, inventory, receivables, payables. I just say working capital, one line item, this is how it affects cash flows. Why? Because I'm incapable of forecasting receivables for the next 20 years. Second, as I said, it's a volatile number. It goes up and down, which means I've got to find some way to smooth it up so that it's not based on last year's number. God help us what that number is. And there will be companies where working capital is negative. You say, what does that mean? Your current liabilities actually exceed your current assets. You know what you're effectively doing as a company then, right? You're using supplier credit as a way to grow. When Amazon did this, I mean, in, in the late 90s, it used to get books from publishers, get three months to pay, sell the books in two weeks and keep the cash to play with for two and a half months. 
So here are, here are three companies that I'm going to show you working capital calculations on. So you can see three different ways in which I had to deal with them. We had Amazon, Cisco, and Motorola. Okay. Amazon and Cisco had negative working capital. So this is way back in time, 2000, had negative working. So this is a young Amazon. Both Amazon and Cisco have negative working capital. Amazon, the working capital is minus 26% of revenues. This is a company that found incredible ways to grow using supplier credit. In fact, this is one of the things that analysts used as a sales pitch for Amazon, the dot-com boom is, hey, this company won't need capital. Publishers will keep providing the capital. This was when they were a book retailer. So Amazon and Cisco have negative working capital. Motorola had a positive working capital. One of the things I try to do when I have things like working capital is I've got to tie it to something else. And the item that it makes the most sense to tie working capital to is revenues. So for each of these companies, I've computed what working capital is a person of revenues. So that's what I have for last year. The task I face is what will it be in the future? Now, one thing I'm not going to look at is last year's change because the number is all over the place. God only knows what will be in the future. But to get a sense of perspective, I looked at this you know, each company's history for the last three years. With Amazon, it was still negative. For Cisco, it was still negative. Motorola was slightly more positive, 8.91%. Now, when you do this for your company, I guarantee you, you can look at the working capital 24 hours and you'd still have no sense of is that high, is that low, because you have no perspective. You have nothing to compare it to. If you look at my evaluation spreadsheets, one of the, the data spreadsheet that I give you with industry averages, one of the things I report is working capital as a percentage of revenues in different sectors. How does it help me? It tells me whether my company's working capital right now is temporary or whether it's permanent. In the case of Cisco, not only was Cisco's working capital negative now, what are, not only has it been negative for the last three years, but the entire sector operates with negative working capital. So you know what? I have no qualms about assuming that working capital for Cisco will continue to be negative. This is a business model feature. The way the business is structured allows for negative working capital. And eventually it might become a you know, kind of a neutral item, but in the case of Cisco, the industry average makes me more comfortable assuming negative working capital going forward. In contrast with Amazon, it's an outlier. It's in a retail business where everybody else, this is a huge drain on their cash flows. Amazon's made it a point, but I don't think even with a company with a business model like Amazon, this is sustainable. And here's why. You know why Amazon was able to use publisher capital to grow initially? Because publishers wanted to sell stuff online. Amazon was often the only platform. And one of the things that Amazon extracted from publishers to be able to sell online is these incredibly generous credit tips. As it gets bigger and you're selling a third of your books online, you can no longer afford to do this as a publisher. Publishers are not exactly flush with cash. So when I valued Amazon, this was way back in time, 20 something years ago, I started with negative working capital. But as I worked through time, just like taxes, I moved that working capital down, but I left it well below industry averages and here's why. Now, I, you know, and many of you might be too young to even relate to this, but if you walk into a traditional bookstore, it's more and more difficult to find one of those. Notice there are dire sections of the bookstore where nobody seems to be. That philosophy section, that deep literature section. There's a big stack of Harry Potters right in the front and there are people who come in and just buy it and leave. When you run a regular bookstore, you've got to maintain what I call show inventory, which is you have to create this illusion that you're an intellectual place and that you care about war and peace, even though nobody's bought a copy in like 50 years. No. That this whole section on poetry, you know, and there's one person who comes once every six months in that section. Because you've got to preserve that illusion. If you're Amazon, you're selling books online, nobody's looking in. They know that 95% of the people who walk in buy a James Patterson, and that's all they're going to ever buy. Guess what? They have hundreds of thousands of copies of James Patterson and none of Tolstoy. You want to order Tolstoy? They'll get it printed <clears throat> in the next three weeks and send it to you. They're not going to keep around 10,000 copies of Tolstoy. I don't mean to be insulted. If you love Tolstoy, all the more power to you. 
But the reality is more people have read James Patterson than in the last year than have read Tolstoy over his entire 300 years or 200 years or 150 years that Tolstoy's have been around. Their steady state inventory will be lower. And I give them that credit with the 3% instead of the 8%. So look at your company's working capital as a percent of revenues in the most recent day. Look at their history, look at the industry averages. And that'll give you a sense of will working capital be a drain at this company or will it actually produce cash flows for me? Which brings me to my final piece on cash flow. So let's see where we are. We've talked about operating income, we've talked about tax rates, we've talked about cap, net capex, we've talked about working capital. But let's talk about what do I have to do if I have to get free cash flow equity? Now, of course, as I said, the lazy way to get a free cash flow equity is look at what companies actually pay out, look at their dividends, and say, if I know that, why should I go looking for free cash flow equity? If you remember in corporate finance, we looked at what companies actually pay. And we look at what they could have paid. And we concluded very quickly that companies don't always pay out what they can afford to. Many of them pay less and accumulate cash. Some of them pay too much. Don't ask me why. But dividends and potential dividends can be very different numbers. That's really my starting point for explaining why we do free cash flow to equity. Free cash flow to equity is potential dividends. When you ask analysts what's potential dividend, there are some analysts who will argue earnings are potential dividends. That is made, made no sense to me. If I paid my entire earnings out as dividends, I would never grow. It's not earnings that are potential dividends. The potential dividends for a company are really the cash flows left over after you've met every conceivable need. Don't make it any more complicated than that. Think of it as an owner of a business, this is the cash left in the till after you've met every conceivable need. So about 30 years ago, when I was thinking about how do I start to compute this, you know, because people kept talking about free cash flow, but there was very, I mean, nobody talked about free cash flow equity. And I said, you know what, it's simple. If you have a company and I can tell what it has as net income and I can see what it's reinvesting and what it's you know, raising from debt, I can tell you what the free cash flow equity is. And I'll give you the shortcut first. The shortcut works if you have a company that, pay, that has already decided that 30% of the reinvestment always comes from debt, 70% from equity. It's made that judgment, it's very close to it. Here's the shortcut that'll give you the free cash flow equity. Start with net income. Why net income? Because we're looking at an equity cash flow. But instead of subtracting out the reinvestment, you subtract out the reinvestment times 70%, 70% being the amount. You, so you, it's very selfish. You're focused on your cash flow. You start with net income, you subtract out the equity portion of net capex and the equity portion of working capital, you got a free cash flow equity. A lot of moving pieces here. So let me try this in a company and you can see how this would play out. So if you can give me what percentage of your net capex and what percentage of your working capital comes from debt, I can tell you what your free cash flow equity. If you don't feel comfortable with that assumption, then you got to do it the long way. The long way, here's what you do. You start with net income, you subtract net capex, you subtract change in working capital, but then you also bring into account the cash flows from debt and to debt. You know what I mean? But from debt, every time you borrow money, that's cash coming into your pocket as an equity investor. Every time you repay an old loan, that's cash leaving. But free cash flow equity is what's left at the end. The statement that you'll find cash flow, everything you need for free cash flow equity is your statement of cash flows. It starts with net income, it's right there. Change in working capital is right below. Depreciation is in the operating section. CapEx and reinvestment is in the investing section. And debt payments are in the financing section. Everything is there. Computing to free cash flow equity is an incredibly straightforward exercise, but it measures what your company could have paid out. So it's, it, it, from a statement of cash flows, here's all you can do. So it's, it's actually, if you, if, you, if you want to do a free cash flow equity from statement of cash flows, start with the cash flows from operations. So that's the first section of your statement of cash flows. Subtract out capital expenditures and acquisitions from the investing section of your cash flows. And then go to the financing section and focus on debt repaid and new debt raised. And you should have a free cash flow equity. Right from that one statement, you don't need to go any further. 
So free cash flow equity is cash left over after debt cash flows have been incorporated. So you look at dividends versus free cash flow equity, and I do this at the start of every year just to show you that the two numbers almost never match. I've looked at free cash flow equity by region of the world here and dividends by region. And I brought in buybacks because obviously some companies have chosen to return it. So if you look at the US for instance, and this was uh, in, 2000 and, uh, in 2020, their free cash flow equity was 290 billion, but dividends plus buybacks are almost 1.2 trillion. Take a typical US company, a lot more cash was returned in dividends and buybacks than was available in free cash flow equity. Some parts of the world, free cash flow equity are negative, but dividends and buybacks are positive. All this table tells you is don't trust dividends. I mean, think of this as an, an extended ad for any time you use the dividend discount model, you're taking a number that might actually be not just arbitrary, reflect inertia, reflect history, and discounting it to value the company. So the reason we focus on free cash flow equity is dividends are not trustworthy. They tell us nothing about the company and valuing a company based on dividends might give you this illusion that you are the safe company. And this is why when people talk about dividend yields, there, there, are, there are some value investors that just buy stocks with dividend yields about 4%, that's a deadly investment strategy. You're gonna get some real losers in there because the companies with dividend yields that high are usually companies where there's a disaster waiting to happen. Some of them might be, you know, might be jewels in, in, in the dirt, but basically just picking companies based on dividend yields, you're gonna get a lot of strange, you know, dysfunctional companies. So here's what I'm gonna end with. I'm gonna show you the free cash or equity calculation for a company. And then I'm going to do a little puzzle and we'll end the class with that puzzle. So this was um, Disney about 20 years ago. So I took net income, the CapEx and depreciation came out of the statement of cash flow. So their collective net CapEx of about 612 million. Their working capital increased by 477 million. So net, I have net income, net CapEx, change in working capital. Let's take the shortcut, let's assume that I told you that Disney raises about 24% of its reinvestment from debt, 76% from equity. So I can use the shortcut, right? I can start with the net income, 1,533 million. I can take the net CapEx, 1746 minus 1134, but look at only the equity portion, 77, 76%, and do the same thing with working capital. I end up with a free cash flow equity of 704 million. These are actual numbers in the year that I did this, they're actual dividends with 345 million. You can already see if I value Disney with a dividend discount model, I'm gonna undervalue the company because I'm missing the remaining 359 million, 358 million. But I'm gonna play a little trick here and this will look like easy money in terms of increasing value, but I want you to tell me what I'm missing. So here's what I did. I just increase the amount of my reinvestment that I'm going to get from debt. Remember I used 24%, I said, what if I use 30, 40, 50? And guess what happens? The more of my reinvestment I fund with debt, the higher my free cash flow equity becomes. Intuitively, you have more cash left over if you can use debt to... And higher free cash flow equity leads to a higher value for equity, right? So all that a company needs to do is to keep borrowing money to fund its reinvestment and its equity value should go up. So that sounds right until you think about what I'm discounting this free cash or equity by. I discounted back at a cost of equity. I know it sound, you know, seemed like I was nitpicking when I talked about how does leverage affect you. The reason I made that big deal about connecting beta to how much you borrowed is the same forces that push up my free cash or equity are also pushing up my beta. Which means as I raise more debt, here's what happens. I have higher free cash or equity and a higher cost of equity. So here's the final question for today. And so let's, let me lay the table here. When I look at a company and I compute free cash or equity and cost of equity, as I raise debt, free cash or equity tends to go up, so does cost of equity. The value of equity is the present value of the free cash loss. So I'm gonna read four statements, you tell me which one of these reflects the truth the best. One is increasing leverage will always increase value because the cash flow effect will dominate the discount rate effect. 
Anybody agree with that statement? I'm glad nobody did because if that were true, we'd be at 99% debt. Unfortunately, I hear a lot of real estate people talking about, hey, let's just borrow more money to make our return on equity go up. That's not going to increase the value of equity where cost of equity goes up even more. So debt is not an unalloyed plus. Could, could, how many agree with the second statement? Increasing debt will reduce value because the discount rate effects will always dominate the cash flow effects. Nobody, okay. You know how many CFOs think that the end game should be to pay, pay down debt? They make this a big deal. Oh, we're gonna pay down debt over the next 10 years, expecting you to applaud and say, that's amazing, that's wonderful. Why would I want you to pay down debt when the tax law is tilted towards debt and your value goes down? So increasing debt doesn't always increase value. Increasing debt doesn't always decrease value. What about the third statement? Increasing debt has no effect on value because the two effects exactly offset each other. This is actually corporate, one of corporate finance's most famous theorems. Do you remember what the theorem was? That debt has no effect on value. Modigliani Miller. Miller Modigliani. And again, I am amazed at how many people latch on to Miller Modigliani and say, oh, debt should have no effect on value. Really, you live in a world with no taxes and no default risk? Here's the bottom line. For your company, debt could potentially increase value decrease value and leave value unchanged. There's no way of knowing until you actually check because there's no one statement that I can make about all companies. And that's why we optimize debt ratios, right? Whether you use the cost of capital approach or whether you use this approach of free cash or equity and cost of equity, we're saying that there is some mix of debt and equity where our value of equity is going to be maximized. Let's find that mix. So as you look at cash flows, we're pretty much done with cash flows. Now go look at the layers, right? There are, none of the layers are particularly difficult, but they pile on top of each other. So if you're not careful, it's easy. If you take shortcuts, you're gonna get into trouble. So always take it a step at a time. And if you do it sequentially and you do it, you know, by following those steps, you're always gonna be okay because you know, it's, it's just common sense. We're trying to apply it to saying, hey, what are the cash flows? for this company and what, how can I use those to make predictions for the future? Because next session, I'll, you know, I'll, hopefully if you've finished your quiz, you can come in, you can have a nice fresh mind. We can talk about leaving the safe places we've been in so far and talking about growth and future cash flows because that's where the rubber meets the road because that's when we start to get uncomfortable. So I'll see you on Wednesday and good luck on the quiz. Take care. Thank you.